Welcome to Beacon Hill Update on Frontier Community Access Television. Back in studio, I'm Chris Collins. The 2016 legislative session is now in the books. We have a state budget and a bunch of other stuff got done on Beacon Hill this year. A lot of exciting stuff and some things that definitely will have impacts out here in the rugged west. Here to talk about them uh, is Representative, actually represent all four Franklin, uh, Frontier towns, yeah. right? Conway, Deerfield, Sunderland, and Whateley. He represents the first Franklin district. His name is Steve Kuehl. He's also the vice chair of the House Ways and Means Committee, which is the committee that put all this stuff together pretty much. Everything kind of flows through your committee, right? Yeah, it's not just the budget and all the major capital spending bills, but pretty much any bill that may have a fiscal impact on the Commonwealth, and that's most anything of, of importance uh, comes to Ways and Means. So it's a great opportunity for me to have some input on a wide variety of bills. Before we get to the specifics, I certainly hope your counterparts in Washington watched what you guys did and actually take some cues because I'll give you a rare compliment. You guys got a lot of stuff done. Yeah. A lot of stuff done. A lot more than a lot of legislatures around the country and certainly much more than our friends on Capitol Hill. Let's start with the budget, though. How much was the budget this year and what were some of the specific areas of focus in terms of spending? Well, thank you for noting that we got a lot done and that we worked very cooperatively, I think, with uh, the new governor uh, ending his second year, um, his first legislative term in office. So our budget is a little over $30 billion. It's a, a lot of money. Um, and it was an unusual event this year, the whole budget process. Um, happy to say that we finished it on time and it was balanced uh, at the beginning of the fiscal year. But there were some glitches. Um, as we, the House adopted its budget in late April, the Senate adopted its budget in late May. Then it goes to conference committee, which I sit on, uh, three members of the House, three members of the Senate to reconcile that. And while we were in conference, we began to notice that some revenue uh, that was expected to support and sustain this budget was beginning not to materialize. And this was primarily capital gains tax revenues, uh, which are always hard to predict. Um, it depends a lot on what kind of stock market transactions, investment transactions people are making unpredictable. It's not as steady as something like income tax or sales tax. It's much corporate taxes that are more predictable. But this was like three quarters of a billion dollars. Right? Yeah, it was a lot. And um, so uh, this is the first time this has ever happened in the years I've been on Ways and Means and working on the budget um, that we had to make adjustments downward um, while it was in conference below what the House and the Senate had adopted in their budgets. And usually it's just a matter of finding common ground between those versions. Uh, but we worked closely with Governor Baker and his administration as they looked at the revenues coming in and kept us surprised of that. And um, the result of it was that there were about $750 million worth of reductions in the budget made while it was still in process. And these were made in conjunction and agreement between the House, Senate, and the governor. So. Um, I think we had all the important players at the table, and um, we maintained our investments in, I think, probably some of the most important things, such as local aid and education. Um, those both grew. Um, we delayed some investments in other things and made some outright spending reductions. Um, so that when we finally adopted that conference committee budget of a little over $30 billion, um, we sent a balanced budget to the governor. But then. You know, he disagreed with some of those decisions and was um, mindful. And we've begun, I should say, now as we sit here in August, um, we're seeing the revenues, I think, um, begin to meet our benchmarks. Uh, we're not really in any, we knew that this was more of a blip than anything else. It wasn't any long-term economic uh, concern. So um, the governor did veto about $250 million worth of spending, uh, and uh, we subsequently, in the month of July, overrode most of that because we felt that we could sustain that. These were good investments, and these were important local investments for Franklin County. I know you've written and talked extensively about the Opioid Task Force, right. which was one of the governor's uh, uh, vetoes that we overrode, and a number of other things that were, have local and statewide importance. So. You know, as we sit here today in the middle of, of August, you know, I can say that we have a responsible and sustainable balanced budget. Um, we are the envy of many other states. I just returned from a legislative conference with folks from a dozen other states who wished they had a rainy day fund like right. we did, that we had a balanced budget, that we, they got it done on time. So we're mindful, we're keeping an eye on things. Um, you know, we, we're, we're prepared if we need to make any further adjustments, but I think we're gonna be okay. The vetoes, and I think it's important to point out that, that the budget you sent 
to him was balanced because he made those vetoes. And yeah, the one that got a lot of attention was uh, the opioid task force money, but also he cut all the funding for the DA's um, anti-crime unit. Right. Which, and I'm looking at this something, and this is a governor who's made fighting the drug problem one of his top priorities. He's campaigned on it. He has run around the state arguing the importance to battle opioids. And two of the things he slashes are the task force and the anti-crime unit for the DA, which goes after drug traffickers. It, right. it, was, it was mind-boggling. Yeah. I don't really understand some of those because the governor, when he issues a veto, um, he usually doesn't explain it uh, substantively. He'll just have a sentence, a one line in his veto message, which will say, doesn't comport with my priorities or you know, doesn't align with, with our budget uh, uh, priorities, something like that. So it's up to us, and we don't override them willy-nilly. Um, you know, there, there are some over, uh, vetoes that we didn't override. We didn't do 100% of what he, he uh, vetoed. But we did the ones that I think really make a difference in people's lives and in districts, like the Opioid Task Force. The Cultural uh, Council the funding. The Cultural too. Council funding, critically important, and tourism funding. Uh, for Franklin County, as we build um, our cultural and tourism economy, connecting with agriculture and all that we have to offer around here and scenic beauty, um, that was really important, uh, and uh, many, many people contacted me about that. Um, the Cultural Council sustains so many local artists and, and art productions and so forth that contribute to the economy. It's not just a feel good, oh, I enjoy that painting or I enjoy that performance. It, it really generates spending and investment um, in the arts and culture economy, and we needed to sustain that. So that was important, I think, had enormous um, support within the legislature. Uh, you also got, did an economic development bill, and in that economic development bill, there was a road use tax that was vetoed that would have been very important out here had it gone through. And, and it wasn't a tax so much as it was a proposal to do a study as to whether or not it made sense to impose a road use tax, which would have, I think, severely and unfairly impacted people out here who drive exponentially farther to get to work than, say, our friends in the Boston area. Right. And the scary thing about that is, if that ever does go through, don't you think that that would be a home run for, for the Boston area and kill us out here? Absolutely. I've never been a supporter of this. This idea has been around for a while. And I understand the arguments that it may alter um, behavior. I've had some constituents say, but, but Steve, if people have to pay um, for the miles they drive, uh, then they're going to drive less. Well, I'm sorry, but that just isn't true when you live in a Conway or Deerfield or Sunderland where, or Worthington, like where I live, where it's 25 miles to get to the supermarket to get anywhere. Uh, people out here just simply, we don't have the public transit options. Um, they have to drive long distances to school and to work, uh, to, for shopping. Um, we don't have those choices. So a vehicle mileage tax makes no sense in a rural area. Um, and I think it, it would have made us pay a lot more than the gas tax. I think the idea of this study was, could this replace the gas tax? I mean, we already pay, because we drive long, a lot of miles, disproportionately high percentage of the gas tax um, compared to people who might ride the T in Boston, because they have that option. So I was pleased that the governor vetoed this. Over time, we're going to have to figure out some way to raise revenue to invest in infrastructure that is not solely tied to the gas tax. And the reason I say that is people are driving more efficient vehicles, um, so they're not buying as much gasoline to, fund, to you know, uh, run them. People are riding electric and hybrid vehicles. Um, and let's face it also, our populations are dwindling or static around here. So um, we're going to have to figure out some way to be able to invest and sustain our infrastructure because we look at all of our towns around here, they have road and bridge issues that cannot be solved within their town borders with town finances. They're going to need state assistance to do so. But I don't think this is the way to do it. It's very discriminatory against rural communities. I've been dying to ask someone about this from the delegation. It, you know, we keep talking about how there's got to be a way to build more money for infrastructure improvements to fix roads. And yet, maybe it's just me, but it seems like this year there's a lot of road construction going on everywhere. It seems like everywhere I turn, there's a major project, yep. either you know, at the edge of the town of Greenfield or on, uh, on Route 5 and 10 in Deerfield. I mean, mm -hmm. it, all, it just seems like there's always road crews out. And you know, 
a lay person that sees this and says, well, I keep hearing about how we have to spend all this money on, on road construction and road improvement, but yet there seems always to be some kind of a project going Well, we on. did a major transportation bond not long ago, and that finances uh, investment in roads and bridges over four years. Um, and it uh, is bearing fruit this year. We've got a great construction season going in terms of uh, getting a fairly early start and the weather's been good. So there are a lot of projects being done, but the backlog is enormous. The, um, uh, the funding we have in the pipeline is not enough. I, I know I don't represent the town of Charlemont, but I read about Charlemont's problems. Yep. It's a town of bridges. Yep. 46. And, yeah, 46 bridges. And, um, they need a lot of help to, uh, some of them are already closed, others are threatened with closure. All of our small towns are that way. I have closed bridges in, in my district that are waiting for state assistance. And I'm glad to say one of the last things we did um, in the last few days of the legislative session is to pass one of the governor's initiatives, which was a small bridge program yeah. uh, to fund uh, investment in bridges under 20 feet. A lot of these bridges on side roads that we have around here that you know, for some reason, bridges are enormously expensive. Um, a 20-foot bridge can cost $700,000 right. and can eat up the entire highway budget of a small town and their Chapter 90 state funds as well. So having a separate program is great. Uh, that's now being launched, and I think it's going to help a lot of towns like, like Charlemont. And I've got some bridges around Conway that I know need some work, too. Oh, yeah, Conway definitely has, yeah. has a bunch of bridges that... They're not, I mean, they're structurally, I think, sound, but they're, they're borderline deficient, yeah. I think, uh, yeah. in many cases. Yep. And so that's a big deal. Now, is that a project that, or a program that's going to be a revolving fund? In other words, will be in perpetuity, or is it just a one-shot deal this year? So it's a one-shot deal, but I think um, this was five years, uh, $10 million a year, total $50 million. Um, I think that's a drop in the bucket. The demand is yeah. so much higher than that. So I'm hoping we can build off of that. And even before the five years has expired, um, put some more money in that and make it a permanent program. You know, nobody pays attention to a bridge until it collapses. Exactly. Or until it becomes shut down and people can't get to work. I mean, it's the kind of thing that you almost take for granted. Well, in our small towns also, it has a tremendous impact on public safety. Um, when you have a bridge that a fire truck can't go over, um, or a bridge that a heating oil truck or a propane truck can't get over so people don't have heat or have to take a long detour. Very often, a town is forced to spend a lot of money on the detour to make it passable. I know I've, I've seen that in a number of towns. So uh, towns can't do it alone. They need state funding. You know, we're coming to the plate to do that. We need a lot more. Uh, in terms of the economic development bill, we touched on the, on the road use tax study. What else is in there? There's a bunch of other stuff in there, I think, that benefits small communities, too. Absolutely. There's a lot of earmarks uh, for different projects that individual members have, have made in that bill. I know uh, Paul Mark had, had an earmark in there for Greenfield, I think, for their senior center. Right. Um, I have one for the Franklin County CDC for their food processing center. Um, they needed about $400,000 to do an expansion of their cooler system and uh, their capacity to bring in produce from local farmers and process it uh, both for commercial and institutional use. A lot of schools uh, and institutions would like to be able to use more local uh, food. So. It benefits farmers, benefits, benefits our ag economy, and that's an earmark in there that we hope to be able to make that investment at the CDC that benefits really the whole region. Um, I got an earmark in there to help finish a bridge project in Buckland, uh, which uh, is still a remnant of uh, Tropical Storm Irene, believe it or Crazy. not. I know. So um, there's a lot of good targeted investments in that economic development bill that, again, help towns out um, and puts people back to work, does investments. So that's what it's all about. Also, there was a municipal modernization bill that you guys did that I think that you know. I think a lot of towns are thrilled about this yeah. because it it fixes a lot of areas where there were holes in mm -hmm. terms of of you know it, it, there were a lot of state laws that exist that don't bear any resemblance to reality when it comes to operating a town. Mm -hmm. And this bill seems to fix a lot of that. Right? You know, this was a great initiative. Uh, Karen Polito, our lieutenant governor, who I, I served with in the legislature for ten years, that she was there. Um, she did a great thing. I mean, she, she took on the portfolio of being the liaison between the governor and municipal government. She ran around the state after taking office in January of uh, 2015 and listened and met with local officials, select boards, town administrators, and made a very, very long list of things that drive you crazy yeah. about, you know, ancient laws and procedures, things you're required to do. A lot of them have to do with managing municipal finance. 
And um, so they filed a bill um, based on that input from local officials. That's pretty comprehensive. It was so comprehensive that it had to be chopped up and sent to six different committees right. in the legislature and then brought all back together again in my committee in Ways and Means. Um, and I'll tell you, it was unanimously approved. There was, there was nothing in here that anyone disagreed with, but it had to do with you know, making less, less burdensome responsibilities on many of our volunteer town officials and part-time town officials. So it has, I think, uh, gonna pay a lot of dividends in the future years. It, it, again, makes borrowing and cash management and accounting a lot easier, got rid of some tiresome old blue law, not blue laws per se, but just sort of anachronistic kinds of yeah. things. So a step in the right direction, great um, cooperation, I think, between you know the Baker Polito people and the House and Senate. The only criticism that I've even heard about that effort was there were some mayors that wanted you to do away with the sort of arcane rules regarding liquor licenses. Yeah. That in fact, yeah. you know, now towns get based, the number of liquor licenses based on population. And the feeling yeah. was it's not realistic. You know, there's a lot of towns like Northampton that are facing competition from the upcoming casino in Springfield. They said, you know, we want to be able to control our own destiny a bit when it comes to liquor licenses in the hospitality industry. How did that get left off? I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm very much open to that. I mean, I've done, we have to do a special law for any town that wants to go over quota. Yeah. I did four extra liquor licenses for Montague this year that had to go through public hearing, House and Senate, Governor's signature, and so forth for some of my other towns as well. Um, I, you know, I think the time has probably come for, for us to turn that back to the towns. I think some of the larger communities are really worried about it. They, they like the sort of check that the legislature can put on a community that might wind up having hundreds and hundreds of more liquor licenses. So there are benefits to the quota system. Maybe there's a middle ground we can reach. Um, you know, I, it's, one of the things I've found that's difficult, and I'll use the example of Montague this year, is um, that sometimes you have a business coming in that needs a liquor license, the town doesn't have one available. So they come to the legislature, and even under the best of circumstances, it can take two, three, four months. It can take five months. So this is a business waiting to make an investment in a community and open a restaurant or a tavern or something. And if they have to wait that long, sometimes they lose the opportunity on the, on the space, on the property, and they don't make it happen. So um, if there's some way we can streamline it, make it more um, uh, expeditious, but at the same time perhaps keep some oversight as to the total number of liquor licenses that are out there in Massachusetts, I think we can find a middle ground on it. So I think it's something we will revisit in the next session. There were some other things that were done as well, and while some of these got headlines and some didn't. Uh, the transgender bill, which got mm -hmm. a lot of ink, uh, finally got done, yep. and it, it closes some loopholes in the law. That uh, and the one that always gets me was the one where you could be a transgender worker in a restaurant and work an eight-hour shift, and if you try to go to eat in that restaurant, and someone in the restaurant objects to you being there, you could be kicked out by your boss. Yes. Yeah. I, I just. We talked about that in the last time you were here, and I, that still blows my mind. But this is a bill that was was not as controversial as it was in other parts of the country, probably oh. because we're a little more liberal here in the we're state. We're a little more liberal, but I certainly heard from some folks who were concerned about it. Um, I think the opponents of it, you know, very, um, they mischaracterized it as being uh, something that um, would open, um, you know, sexual, you know, perverts or molesters of children and bathrooms and so on and so forth. It's not that at all. It's, it's about equal accommodations for people in, in public uh, spaces. And um, what it basically comes down to is allowing people to use um, the bathroom facility that they feel most comfortable in. And it has nothing whatever to do with sexual predators as much as the other side tried to make it seem that way. Um, so it was a logical next step, I think, in making sure that all of our citizens feel that they are equally entitled to the same rights and benefits as everyone else. It ended some discrimination. We are not by any means the first state to do this. I think we're the 15th or 16th, something like that. And we saw the controversies that it created in places like North Carolina. Um, so. Uh, where you know the the NBA pulled its All Star game out yeah. of there uh, for next year um, because they don't want to go to a place that allows discrimination against anyone. And so I'm very proud of the fact that we did this. It took a while to do it to work out the details. 
and, and uh, the timing had to be right, um, and I think the timing was right. So kudos, I think, to the legislature for taking it up and doing it, and kudos to Governor Baker for signing it. You've been in the game a long time. You've been a politician for, for years, and you've seen a lot of things. I think what, one of the things around the transgender issue that was surprising to me, maybe not surprising is not the right word, maybe alarming is the right word, is the, the, the willingness that some people have to discriminate against people based on who they love, the color of their skin. I mean, it's, it seems like in some ways we're going backwards as a political culture, and you can see it manifesting itself in some of the ideas, and I use the ideas in quotes, being thrown around in the, in the, in the national presidential campaign. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's pretty unsettling to see you know, that we seem to be a nation of cavemen in a lot of ways in terms of some of our beliefs. And as somebody who's been in the business and who's, who, who's someone who's watched this, I, I guess I kind of want, want to get your take on that as well. Well, it's interesting because most of the rights uh, that um, have been denied to certain people in our society over the years are rights that seem so clearly enshrined in our Constitution. They're there. And, uh, but, you know, in a way, society has had to catch up over 200 plus years with, I think, what the founders envisioned, which was a society equal for all with opportunity for everyone. And um, for all kinds of reasons and biases and, and bigotry and, um, and hate, in many cases, uh, we have seen that happen slowly and unfold, you know, step by step in our nation. But what's happened in the last decade since marriage equality became um, an accepted part of of our lives, first of all in Massachusetts, proud to say, uh, but then the rest of the country caught on. And and, uh, I realize that it's still a little difficult for many people to wrap their arms around and understand it. Um, But as time goes on, I don't hear much objection. People take it you know, for granted now, uh, certainly around here. I think it's, uh, so the next logical steps are to deal with some of the additional, you know, gender issues and, and racial issues and things that, that still linger in society. And, you know, the tenor of uh, some of the presidential campaign this year is really disappointing um, uh, on one side uh, because it feels like some, some people trying to pull us backwards in exactly. time. Exactly, that's my point. And, yeah. and it's just... We're not, you know, the thing that's, we've talked about this before. Uh, In many ways, it's a generational issue. Um, You know, whether or not there should be equal rights and opportunities for transgender people is not an issue for younger people. Uh, For anybody, you know, in their mid-30s or younger, they go, what's the problem? Uh, You know, it's the same thing with marriage equality. Um, So, uh, you know, I think the the generation that's coming up and hopefully the generation that will be coming into positions of uh, political leadership in the coming years, um, it's going to be a whole different conversation for most of them. And because they're just not going to see things the way things were seen in the past. And, you know, we're in a global economy. I mean, look at any crowd in in a concert or a movie theater or at the supermarket. And you see so much more diversity than I saw when I was a kid. Right. So, you know, it's a changing world, changing society. I think it's changing for the better. One of the other things that dovetails into my next question, the next topic is the equal pay issue. Uh, for many years, and in, in not just in Massachusetts, but around the country, women have been working for appreciably less money than men per hour. And you've taken steps, this legislature's taken steps this time around to change that. Talk about this bill a little bit. Absolutely. Um, Another sort of late in the session uh, issue that came up, I'm so glad we got it done, um, equal pay bill in Massachusetts, um, which means that you cannot be discriminated against. We all know that women for the same job um, will earn less than a man will in the same position. Um, Our goal is to end that in Massachusetts, and hopefully we can begin to pave the way for that to end in the country. So, for example, one of the ways that women were traditionally um, uh, discriminated against in the workplace as far as salary is they'd be asked, well, what was your previous salary when they were applying for a job? You know, this law won't allow that to be asked in a job interview um, or it won't be part of the conversation. So there are that and a number of other things will help, I think, women attain the same pay for the same job that a man has. Um, that's going to be good for our economy. It's going to be good for families. Um, you know, there's a lot of families where women are the primary breadwinner or an equal breadwinner. And um, so I think, again, society will, as a whole will only benefit from this if we don't have discrimination. And whether it's in pay or it's in accommodations, it's on opportunities, 
these have to end. They are ending little by little. And I think the pay equity bill was a great step in that direction. It's unfortunate that you have to have a law to mandate that. It's too bad that it yeah. couldn't be something that would be mandated. Yeah. It would just be part of the lexicon anyway. Yeah. 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 You're right. One other thing that, and I want to end with this because this is probably not that important, but I think for some people, especially an agrarian community like this, it might be interesting. And that is, uh, Tucked into the economic development bill was a rider that would allow for a study as to whether or not it would make sense for Massachusetts to remain on Eastern Daylight Time year round. Mm -hmm. As we all know, we set the clocks back in the fall, we spring ahead, and that that time has shortened because they, they've extended. Yeah. The, yeah. But now this idea, I guess, would study whether it makes sense to just do away with Eastern away Standard with Time it. altogether right. and just become a daylight state. Is that something that's even remotely interesting or something you would support? So I'm really skeptical of it for, for a couple of reasons. Um, I don't mind having a study of it to you know, get a better handle on it, sort of put the issue to rest one way or the other once and for all. But to me, I, it goes back to what I just said about being in a global economy. So what happens if everyone in Boston is at work at a different time than everyone in New York or Washington or wherever else they do business with? Okay, okay. Uh, that we're an outlier in a different time zone. Uh, you know, how does that factor into things? I understand that the transitions at daylight savings time and standard time in the spring and fall are often difficult for people to adjust to and, and so forth. Um, it was originally done as a way to save energy, uh, and, and they've been you know, extended as, as an energy saving measure. But um, so it'll be interesting to find out what, what the impact. There's, a, there's another, there's someone in Massachusetts who's been really pushing us to, to not only just not have daylight savings time or standard time, but to go to maritime time. Okay. He wants us to go an hour earlier uh, where the, the Canadian maritime provinces are and leave it that way. So it's not Scott Brown. We'd be it? like two hours off. No, it's not Scott Brown. So we'd be two hours <laughs> off of the rest of the East Coast. So maybe, maybe this is a compromise. I don't know. But it's one of those studies that, uh, you know, will probably be mildly interesting to read and probably go nowhere. One of the arguments in favor of it was the idea that I guess if, people, if, if it's lighter or longer, people will go shopping more likely. Because I guess, it's, and I, this is true for me a little bit in the winter, when it's the, the days are shorter, you kind of cocoon. You know, yeah. at 5 o'clock, you go home to, you know, you know rather you might, you might go out if it's yeah. later, two hours later, who knows. Yeah, maybe. That could be. I know, uh, you know, everybody's psyche changes when it's dark a quarter of five or something, you know. Uh, I've been noticing it already, yeah. um, that it was pretty dark at 8 o'clock last night. Yeah. So that's a whole hour different than a while ago. I but. still love the fall. I can't help it. Yeah. Well, this is going to be a fall where you go be on the campaign trail and you still be, it'll still be in session informally, though. I mean, Informal yeah. session. So um, we could do legislative business, uh, things like liquor licenses for towns that need an extra one. We can do business like that. Um, as long as there's no objection, we have formal sessions in the House and Senate twice a week for the rest of the year. Um, any one person can object, so nothing really controversial gets done. And if something like a supplemental budget needs to be done, which it will, um, a final deficiency budget to close out the past fiscal year, these things tend to be done by consensus and with agreement between the Democrats and Republicans. And um, so, uh, again, nothing really major or controversial, but some routine business. And then in January, after the dust is settled and uh, you go back to start the next two-year session, but it was quite a, quite a session this It was time. a really productive session, I think. We got a lot done, of, a lot of things we didn't even get to mention here today necessarily, but I think you hit on the, some of the major ones. But um, I think it bodes well for the next two-year session. I think we've, there's some things we, we didn't get to that we want to do. Uh, an omnibus agriculture bill, for example, that passed the Senate but didn't take, get taken up in the House. Um, Non-compete uh, legislation, we were very close at the end but didn't get done. So, uh, and again, I think we found that we can work well with the governor. Um, there's, there's a good relationship between the legislature and him. And so uh, he'll be going into an election cycle yeah. um, uh, as we begin in January, as he looks ahead toward running for re-election in 2018. So that could change the dynamic a little bit. But, you know, I'm pretty hardened by the amount we got done this year, and it's been very cooperative. Well done, my friend. Thank you, Chris. We'll have you in again soon. My guest has been First Franklin District State Rep Steve Kulik. That's Beat Hill Update. Thanks for watching. For all of us here at FCAT, have a good day.